holds. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, I did forget to mention one thing. We do have our quarterly business meeting next Sunday, if I'm right, October 6th. That's next Sunday. So Sunday after church, we have a quarterly, unless we're not prepared and somebody let me know and then we can go on from there. Uh, we can try to another Sunday, but that's what we had decided the last time. So October 6th. October 4th. Huh? 4th. Is that a 4th? Why do I keep saying 6th? <laughs> okay, October 4th. I got 6 on the brain, I guess. Okay, October 4th, Sunday, <laughs> after church. Unless we're not prepared, and then just let me know, and then we can move it. All right. So we are starting a series. Uh, we started a couple of weeks. The best discipline is self-discipline. And we're in part two, even though this is the third sermon, because I took forever on the uh, introduction that one Sunday. Uh, this is self-discipline strategies for a victorious life. And I said some of this will be kind of practical. Some of it will be like my opinion, and I've said before, if it's my opinion, you know what you can do with that, right? You can take it or leave it, all right? And so, and maybe you say, hey, I never thought of it that way, or you thought, no, that's, I don't want that. And some of it's straight from Scripture. And uh, so, we talk about how uh, a person who does not have self-discipline it's like a person without, or like a city without walls. And they can be ran over at any time. And that we needed to have rules in our life. Self-rules. To protect us and keep ourselves holy. And so we call it self-discipline. So God doesn't have to discipline us. Or, or people of authority don't have to discipline us. The other day, uh, I, I drive... Uh, a bus route for DSI early in the mornings now and uh, I came up to a section where there's an arrow and the arrow had just turned off but everybody was sitting there so I just went ahead and turned thinking that it was just a continuous continuation of the arrow the policeman did not take it that way and pulled me over okay if I had disciplined myself at that moment and said, you know, there's no arrow, I stop, make that a rule, I would not have been disciplined by the policeman. Now, thank God, she didn't give me a ticket. Um, I got a scolding. I'll take that. <laughs> but I wouldn't have gotten that scolding even if, if I hadn't yielded, if I should have yielded the right of way, she said. And, and uh, I tried to explain to her my point, but it did not matter. Uh, that's what we're talking about. If we don't have rules, standards, convictions, if we don't build walls to protect ourselves, then if we're not disciplining ourselves, somebody else will. And then sometimes, and a lot of times, it'll be God. So let's read this introduction. Your thoughts will be, will be revealed by your behavior. I, I want to re read that. Your thoughts will be revealed by your behavior. I don't need to read your minds. I don't need to. You don't need to read my mind. All we have to do is deserve. And you will show me exactly who you are by your behavior. Now you can fake it for a little while, but it comes out. Your thoughts will be revealed by behavior. All the time. Uh, I don't like sweet potatoes. I don't like them. Everybody says, well, you haven't had my sweet potatoes. There's one main ingredient in every dish of sweet potatoes. What is that? Sweet potatoes. <laughs> no matter what you do to them, Kay loves them. That's fine. We have baked potato. I bake my potato, and then I bake her sweet potato. And I make sure it never touches mine. I don't like it. 
You know I don't like it a lot of times when you go to hand it to me and I make what? Faces. My face, my countenance, my behavior will tell you I don't like sweet potatoes. When I go and, and pitch in dinner and I walk by and I see, see sweet potatoes there, you know what I do? I avoid it. Now that's a simple example, but it's true. Your behavior will tell us what you're thinking. Before you did it, you thought about it. Your first discipline will be your thoughts. Your first self-discipline will be to try to make walls about your thoughts, rules about your thoughts. What I dwell on, what I think about, what I allow into my eyes and my ears, and what I'm thinking about will eventually come out of behavior. Back in the 1970s, there was a study by the U.S. government and the effects of pornography. You know what they found out? Those who were constantly watching and entertained by pornography, they end up acting out what they see and what they hear. Rapes go up. Child molesting goes up. Because they allow their minds to do what? Think on that. Your thoughts will come out in behavior. I know exactly who you are and what you're thinking by how you act. Are you gradually, as you gradually think as the world, your behavior will gradually change. So a Christian who thinks like the world and starts thinking like the world and starts saying, you know what, maybe they have a point, maybe this, maybe that. And remember the devil never told Eve to sin. What did, she, what did he do? Just asked her some questions. Just asked her some questions. And when he asked her questions, what did she start doing? Thinking. And it slowly slips into your thinking. And then it becomes behavior. There would not have been in the 50s one gay pastor anywhere. Nowhere. Nowhere in the 50s would a pastor endorse abortion. Nowhere. And so it's very important. The Bible even talks about the guarding of our thoughts and our minds. And that being with God is a transformation of our thoughts and our minds. Your first battle will be your mind, your thoughts. That change will ruin your life every time. Worldly thinking will ruin your life. It will. You're never happy. Never. What the world gives you, what the world wants to offer you, does not bring joy. Does not bring true success. It does not. Christians must make effort to question the thoughts that are not good or acceptable to God's will. Question those thoughts that come in. Challenge them. Have rules that I set up so I don't put myself in positions where I listen to those things or see those things. So I'm not thinking that way. We talked before, if we haven't, I think I meant to, people, places, and things. I can control who I'm with. I can control where I am, and I can control what I have in my hands. And the minute you don't control those things, 
you begin to think, these people aren't so bad. Look how friendly and nice they are. I know they're in the world, but they're cool. It's nice. It's all right. And slowly their thinking will creep into your heart and your mind. Careful. Guard against that. The following list will assist you in your efforts. <clears throat> it says here in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And we talked last week about our bodies. And we said, you know, people say, it's my body, I can do what I want. And actually, no, it's not. The Bible tells us if you're a Christian, your body has been bought with a price, a very heavy price. It's not. But he says, I want you to present your body a living sacrifice. I could go on all day on that, what that means. And hardly anybody is there. A living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto who? God, the Creator. We talked about that this morning in Sunday school. That as soon as I realize that God exists, I'm responsible to Him. And too much of our lives and too much of men's lives are revolved about being responsible for this and that and this and over here. And forget the responsibility to God. God first. If I am sacrificing my life to God, then everything else in life comes true. And if my relationship with God is good, then my relationships everywhere else will be good. Where we want a life that's acceptable unto God. Which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. But be transformed. But how? By what? The renewing of your mind. What you're thinking. What you allow your thoughts to be. I do not. Well, let me finish the verse. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. For your life. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of you. And you're not successful in your life if you're not fulfilling God's purpose for your life. God has a will for you. And He expects you to perform it. And if we present ourselves living sacrifices unto Him, and we watch how we think, it makes it easier to perform the will of God in our lives. See, there will be thoughts like bitterness that will creep in, and we don't get that out of there, and we keep thinking on it, and it will come out in our behavior. Anger, hatred, hurt, and those thoughts will be there compromise. Well, they're not so bad. I've, I've worked with some homosexuals. They're pretty cool people. I, some of them are pretty nice. I like hanging out with them. And you begin to think and conform to this world. And that keeps you from fulfilling the will of God in your life. Everyone here has a plan and a purpose for their life. The question is, are you fulfilling it? Are you serving God? What is your ministry to God? What is it? You should be able to easily say that. If not, you're not fulfilling God's will for your life. Every ministry, every Christian ministry through the local church should be. So, let's go over the list of things that is going to help us with our thoughts. 
with our thoughts, self-discipline that will help us with our thoughts. Because we want to be successful. We want to have a victorious Christian life. We want to be like, you know, Joshua and Moses. We want to be like that. And trust me, right now in our country, we could use a Joshua and a Moses and an Abraham. That would be awesome. How many saw the, the, the rally they had in Washington, D.C. yesterday? Anybody? Thank God. What was it? Prayer. God is calling our nation to prayer. Thank you, Franklin Graham. Thank you. One man can make a difference. Called the nation of prayer. I wanted to go. I wish I could have gone. One, I've never been to Washington, D.C. I've always wanted to go. But I wanted, I wanted to support that. And so we must challenge these voices, these thoughts. And how can we do that? Well, the first one is work on your love for God. Work on your love for God. And it does take work. I don't know about you, but I get involved with life, and I get busy, and you know who I forget about the most, the first of all? God. I'm busy, I'm trying to take care of what Kay wants me to do, and, and I'm trying to do that, and she has a big list, I'm telling you, just... <laughs> And then there's the kids, and then there's work, and then there's the car, and then there's, you know, the yard, and there's this, and there's that. And I have to force myself. I cannot be the only one. Say, wait a minute, stop, wait. I need to work on my relationship, my love with God. I was teaching one time about loving God, and it was in an addictions program, so I can get by with this, okay? It wasn't church. And the guy's sitting over here, and he's, he, he's drunk. Anybody came, and I always had a rule, you can come drunk, you can come high, as long as you're not disrupting, because I want to help you. And so he's sitting over there in the corner, and he's drunk, and I'm talking about the love of God, and he goes, I love God. I let it go. Keep saying, he goes, I love God. Third time he said it, I was done. I said, no, you don't. Don't sit here and tell me you love God. He goes, what do you mean I don't love God? I said, you cheat on your wife. You're drunk right now. You love you. And it's the truth. Don't tell me you love God. If you're not willing to obey him. Don't tell me you don't love God. If you're not willing to take time to talk to him. Don't tell me you love God. And never come to church. That, that irks me. I'm sure you work with people like that. Oh I love God. And I love Jesus. When's the last time you've been to church? When's the last time you opened the Bible? When's the last time you prayed to Him when it wasn't an emergency? Don't tell me you love God. Don't tell me that. Now listen to me. He always loves you whether you love Him at the moment or the time or not. And He tells us to do the same. It gets a little more difficult for us to love those that hate us or against us, that are fighting and struggling against us, but that's the commandment, and that's what I try to do. I love, whether you're lovable or not. But don't tell me you love God and not spend time with Him. How long would Kay and I be married if I told everybody I love her, but I never talked to her, I never spend time with her? The only time I talk to her is when I need something. Oh, by the way, Kay, I need you to take care of this woman. Thank you. And I won't see her for like a week. That's not love. We like to use God. Not love Him. 
And so if you want to challenge the thoughts that are coming out in behavior, you need to work on your love for God. A heart that wants to seek Him. A heart that wants to know Him. That wants to learn of Him. That wants to obey Him. Doesn't mean we don't mess up. We do. David was a man after God's own heart. The apple of God's eye. All those things. And you read through David's life and he messed up a lot, didn't he? What made it... Why, why would God say that? Because every time he did, what did he do? He made it right. I want to be in a position that God will bless me. I love God and it hurts me when I hurt him. That was David. Does it hurt you when you hurt God? See, I love how God can take things of the earth and illustrate for us so we can understand our relationship with him. A husband who hurts his wife and doesn't care. It's not love. It's not. A co-worker, you say, I love that person, but you can hurt them and not care. It's not love. It's not. And so you have a God you say you love, but you can hurt him every day and disobey him and never spend time with him, and you want to tell me you love him, you do not. So you need to work on your love for God. And it's work. Because deep down inside, man and women, mankind is selfish. We are. And so that's why we have to struggle with this and fight it. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Every day, he has to kill himself so he can work on his love with God. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 15, very plainly, if you love me, you will do what? Keep my commandments. How do we show God that we love him? By obeying him. By obeying him. So the question today is, are you obeying Him? Do you spend time with Him? Do you really love God? Don't just say the words. It means nothing. I can tell anybody that I love them. I can go out the street and tell people all the time, I love them. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love this rock. Means what? Absolutely nothing. It's good to hear, right? And you should tell the people you love every day you love them. It's good to hear. Love in action is real. So God says, I don't want to hear that you love me. Isaiah, I'm, I'm really getting on this now. And Isaiah, they talked about how they love God. They love God. They love God. And he says, basically, I don't want to hear it because your mouth says it but your heart is far from me. Don't tell me you love me and you won't obey my commandments. Don't tell me you love me and you never look at your Bible. I wrote that for you. Don't tell me you love me and you won't do what it is I want you to do. I have a will. I have a purpose for you. A ministry for you. And you keep saying, I can't. Remember Moses? <laughs> I don't speak very well. Did God take that as an excuse? No. Don't tell me you love God and you're not even willing to do the ministry he's asked you to do. Work on your love of God and those, though that love and that obedience will help control the thoughts that come, the worldly thoughts that come into your mind. The next discipline is depend on Bible study, prayer, worship, and Christian service. Depend on it. There are four disciplines that you can always depend on to improve your behavior. Therefore, result in a better life. One, personal Bible study every day. 
every day you should have Bible study on your own. I don't care if you read through the Psalms, Proverbs, whatever it is. You study one verse, you study one word. I'm a big word person. I'll read through and I hit a word. And all of a sudden now I've got to do a study on that word. You need to study your Bible every day. Every day you need to be in your Bible. It's great to hear preaching every day. That's great. I, I'm for it. It's great to, to have time when you talk about God with others. That's awesome. Open up that Bible, though, and read it every day. We want to talk about controlling our thoughts so we're not conformed to the world, so we're transformed. You know what the Bible will do? It'll transform your thoughts. People ask me all the time, Mike, is it really that important? Well, ask the devil. Because the minute you make a commitment that I'm going to study my Bible every day, every day the devil will what? Fight you. Well, this is my Bible study time and the phone will ring or somebody will text you. There will be some kind of emergency. Don't let things keep you from your personal Bible study. And it'll help fight those thoughts that come across in your mind. The thoughts of depression, the thoughts of anger, the thoughts of whatever they may be. It'll help fight those. So we don't conform to the world, but we're transformed. Number two, personal prayer time every day. Every day, uh, have a time and a place like Daniel did. Every day, Daniel had a certain time, a certain place he prayed. It was so routine, everybody knew it. Now, I'm not saying you do it to be shown, and to be seen by men, but everybody knew it. So much so, they tried to pass a law, because they knew he would do it. Do you? Time, you get alone, and it's just you and God. I love so much when my wife and I first got married and, and I finally moved into the house and I get to leave one morning for work. She said, can we have prayer time every morning? Just us. I love that. Some mornings are shorter than others. It depends on how fast I got up. But we have prayer time together every morning. I love it. But that's not enough. That's great that we do that. But she needs to work on her personal relationship with God. Because if her personal relationship with God is right, then her relationship with me will be. And I need to work on my personal relationship with God. Because if my personal relationship with God is right, then mine and hers will be. And so I have to have my own personal time where I get with God and we talk. Because that's a relationship. And she needs her own personal time where she gets alone with God and they talk. And so do you. Do you have your personal prayer time? We're talking about self-discipline. Discipline yourself. This time, every day, I read my Bible. This time, every day, I get alone with God and it's just me and Him. Number three, Worship God every day. Worship God every day. Now, this is a recommendation. Take it or leave it. But you want to be happy? I worked in a place that I dreaded going in. But I had to because I had to pay bills. It was an awful place. Awful people awful atmosphere and it literally took my joy away. I don't know if you've ever been in some, a situation like that or a building like that. I thought the building was demon-possessed. Because <laughs> I would go in and my countenance would fall. And I'd have to sit out of my car and pray. And the prayer that hit for me was, God, don't let them take my joy today. 
And I went in, and after a while, people would say, Mike, you're always happy. Why are you always happy? Let me tell you a secret. There's a lot going on with this world, isn't there? A lot of bad stuff. Riots, this, that. People being shot. There's a lot to make you sad and depressed. People getting sick. But if I set my mind in the worship of God, Thank you, God. I got up this morning. Thank you, God, my car started. Thank you, God. And start thanking Him and worshiping Him and praising Him sometime in your day. Guess what happens to your countenance? You can't but have joy when you're in the presence of God. Joy will come. This is something I recommend. You can take it or leave it. But every day, pick a time where, or this, me, it's when something comes up and it's struggling and I'm, and I'm starting to think bad things, like I'm going to take care of this in my flesh, and then I, I need to start worshiping God. And I thank Him, and I praise Him, and my whole countenance changes. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So, take it or leave it. The first two you should do. This one, I think it's just helpful. Praise and worship Him. Take time to do that. Number four, Christian service, good works, every day. Every Christian needs to adopt all four of these disciplines into their everyday life. If you do, you will bring value to your life. You'll bring value to your life. The value comes from who? God. And your relationship with Him. Christian service. Every day, you should do good works. Good works does not save us. Good works do not keep us saved. Not a, I don't care how many good works you do. It will not save you from hell. But listen to me. Good works will save your life. It will save your life. Doing good to others will make you fulfilled in life. It will bring value to your day to do good to others. Remember, there's only two commandments, really. Love God and what? Love others. Love automatically means I'm giving. You want to bring value to your life? You want to bring success to your life? Learn to do good works. Learn what it is that God has for you to do, your ministry, your purpose, and do it every day. You'll feel so much confidence, so much strength, Fulfill, because I'm doing what it is that God wants me to do. Kay and I went to a uh, marriage day night. Is that what they call it? Marriage night? I loved it. I highly recommend it. It'll be next year. <laughs> I loved it. Kay asked me a long time ago, do you ever cry? Eh, I do. It's not in my nature, but I do. That night, a comedian called Michael Jr. was telling a story. Now, he's a Christian. He didn't used to be. He is now. And he's a Christian comedian, or a comedian who's a Christian. How's that? That's better. A comedian who's a Christian. He's telling a story, and he's telling his jokes, and he's always two or three jokes ahead. And I understand what that means. I, I, I'm always two or three sentences ahead when I'm speaking. And so he's always two or three jokes ahead, and, and as he's thinking about, he delivered the one joke, and he's thinking about the other one he's about to deliver, he looks at a lady, and God says to him, bring her on stage. God, you, he said, God, you know, I, I work alone here, you know. I work alone. He went ahead and told the other joke, and he looked over and saw the lady again, and she's deaf. There's an interpreter. And God's saying, bring her on stage. God, 
There's nothing funny about a deaf lady on stage. But God was telling him to. So he asked her to come on stage, and the interpreter came. And he doesn't know what he's, he no clue what he's doing. It's not part of his act, it's not part of his routine. And so he asked the interpreter, asked her, what does she need? The interpreter asked her, came back, and she said, nothing. And he's thinking, God, what did you do here? So he said, no, ask her again, what is it that she needs? So the interpreter asked her, who came back and said, My husband and I haven't been on vacation for years. We could really use a vacation. Now, he says his first thought was, Oh, let's pass a hat, or I'll pull out some money and pay for them to go on vacation. But he felt moved to ask one more question. Why not? So he asked, Why not? The interpreter asked her, Came back. We have a special needs child. Needs a special nurse to watch him when we're gone. And we can't find anybody to do that. Anybody that we trust to do that. It wasn't money. That wasn't the issue. She had a real need. And so he turned to the audience, and this is when I started crying. He turned to the audience and says, are there any special need nurses out here? Now, what are the odds of that? Anybody? You know how many are, there are in the United States? I mean, they're just, any special, nobody answered. He goes, this woman has a need. Is there anybody out there who's a special needs nurse? She raised her hand, the lady in the audience said, I am. Came down, introduced the two of them, come to find out she only lived. This is when I started bawling. 30 minutes from her home, and she could do this while they go on vacation. And I started crying, I turned to Kay, and I said, Kay, that's the kind of church I want. Right there. That's what I'm looking for. That's the kind of church I want. Christian service, meeting people's needs. Everybody here has a purpose. A ministry. Are you meeting people's needs through your local church? If not, you're not fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your life, His will. And how in the world are you supposed to be happy and confident and strong and successful in your life? Good works every day, fulfilling God's purpose and plan for your life. Every day. And that'll take some of those thoughts out of your mind. You know why? Because I'm thinking about the needs of others and how I'm going to meet it instead of me. Instead of me. 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 We have too many churches. That are making fat lambs, fat sheep, fat. I want to bring in some sheep that are hungry. They, they, they don't even know they're hungry. They're thin and they need God's word. And they need to be taught and they need to be ministered to. I want to go out and make new sheep. And bring them in. And teach them. And be there for them. I want a ministry, a church that meets needs. Not make each other fat. And I tried to wipe the tears away because I didn't want Kay to know I was crying. It moved. And that, if we're meeting needs, if we're ministering, if we're doing what God wants us to do in Christian ministry, It'll help take away some of those thoughts. It's difficult to focus on yourself when you're focused on others. Then the last one. Associate with Christian friends. I know the next statement will make some people angry. But Christians cannot have unsafe friends. I teach this all the time in 
my addictions program, but it's true. We're to be friendly and loving to everyone, the saved and the unsaved. We're going to meet the needs of the saved and the unsaved. But who I associate with is very important. Who I call friend, who I spend the majority of my time with, is very important. Christians do not have the luxury to have lost friends. Because they cannot help you with spiritual things. So a Christian, everything is spiritual, by the way. Somebody dies in your family or dying in your family. And you go to your lost friends for advice. Can they give you Christian, godly advice? No. They cannot. I know a guy who was in the factory and his wife had left him. And he was sad. He was a Christian. And he cried a lot at work even. And eventually some of the people, co-workers, now they met right. Listen to me. They met right. But to the world, their philosophy and their advice is always evil. And they meant to help this person. They came to this Christian man and said, hey, go out with us tonight. We'll find you some girl. You have sex with her and you'll forget about all. You'll forget her forever. And that was their advice. Now, if this person's mind was not focused on God, Bible reading, prayer time, their Christian service, you know what they might dwell on? Just that thought and that advice. You cannot have lost friends. Doesn't mean you don't spend time with them. Jesus spent time with Drunkards and sinners and prostitutes. Yes, he did. Under his terms. Your friends. And what I mean by that, people that you depend on for advice. People you depend on when you're in trouble. People that you associate the majority of your time with, outside your wife or husband. They cannot be lost. Discipline yourself that I will have Christian friends. And I will spend the majority of my time with Christians. The Bible even says that we're supposed to prefer one another. I've had Christians say, I don't go to church because all those Christians are hypocrites. And the world, they're a lot friendlier. Yeah. And they'll say that. You ever notice how the world will help you out and, and lost people? They're friendlier. So what? They'll destroy your life. One last story about this. You know, another guy in the factory, Christian, but he began, began to slip in his church attendance. I know because I went to church with him. Tried to help him with that, tried to encourage him to keep going to church, but he began to slip. He was invited by some people on Friday night to go to a bar. No, no, I don't go to bars, he said. Well, you can just go to the restaurant. You don't have to go to the bar. I heard he was going to go. I went to him. I said, are, are you really going to go? He goes, yeah, I'm just going to the restaurant. I said, you'll start in the restaurant. You'll end up in the bar. And then you'll end up in a mess. Anybody thinks this story ended well? It all started because he began to start missing church. And then he got away from ministering and being involved in church. And he would attend, and he'd come, he'd listen, he'd sing, and, and then he'd go home. But he wasn't involved in ministry. And he was missing it more and more. Eventually, now he doesn't go at all. I don't need church. I'm fine. I'm all right. Everybody else has got the problem. But look at his life. It's a wreck. It's a mess. Because he let those thoughts come in because of lost friends. They don't have your best interest in heart. Really, they do not. I don't know how many times when I was in the factory, 
men would come to me and say, Mike, you're going to go to Poplar Street with us? That's the big bar back then. I don't know. No, I'm not. And I, Why not? I don't drink. I don't do those things. And they said, come on, you need to live a little. What they really meant was, come on, sin a little. But I know a little sin leads to great disasters. And if we're not careful, and we don't build walls, and we don't discipline our thoughts by having our prayer time, and our Bible study time, and our Christian service, if we're not learning to discipline our thoughts by trying to work on our love for God, if we are not disciplining our thoughts because we want to have friends in this world, you'll end up the same way. And you can still be in church and be a long way from God. A long way. And it comes out in your behavior. Because your thoughts will be revealed by behavior. Every bow, head bowed, every eyes closed. Father, I thank you for your words. I thank you that you love us no matter how far away we get, how bad we get. Lord, I pray that we challenge each other to be disciplined in our lives. To build walls. These four things, these three things, Lord, I think help us. That if we're, if we're focused on our love for you and working on that. If we're focused on our relationship with you through Bible reading and prayer time and our Christian service. And by praising and worshiping you. And Lord, that we're focused on having the right influences that we allow in our inner circle. Lord, I do believe they'll help us be more successful, more victorious in our Christian life. Like Lord, I pray that we all take that challenge in our lives. Pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.